Okay, I think we're ready to start. Um, hi, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, presentation about Open Layers. Okay, so uh, Open Layers 6. Um, so, first, some introduction. My name is uh, Olivier Guyot. I work at Camp to Camp, I'm a developer. I work in France, Chambéry. And Camp to Camp is a company that is based in Lausanne, in Switzerland. And we specialize in different kinds of geospatial softwares. Uh, QGIS, GeoServer, of course, OpenLayers, GeoNetwork, and others. Okay, so um, this talk is about the new version of OpenLayers that is about to come out, version 6. I'm going to start with some context so that everyone understands what we're talking about. Um, also, I will try to keep this talk not too technical. So if it's either too technical or not enough, you can ask questions afterwards. Um, which, how many of you have already used open layers in their projects? Okay, that's a lot. More than I expected. <laughs> cool. All right, so some context. Open Areas is a JavaScript library for making interactive maps. It's a bit of a comp like complex library because it's pretty powerful. It can handle many different formats and can also handle different projections. So uh, it's really powerful, versatile. Um, it's been around since 2006 for version one, so 13 years. and. Uh, there was a version 3 that was published in 2014. Uh, version 3 was a complete rewrite of the library. So sometimes on the internet you see people still using the OpenAirs 2 version, which is basically a completely different library. Um, so the project is uh, following semantic versioning, and we, uh, the latest release is uh, 5.3. There is a beta version for version 6, which is a, has been available, I think, since February. So it's a, it's a pretty long-running beta. And the project is hosted on GitHub OpenLayers slash OpenLayers. So the development of the library has been funded by several companies over the years. To name a few, uh, we have SwissTopo, which is the Swiss Federal Topographic Agency. Terrestris, Boundless, not so much now. Camp to Camp. Uh, and others. There is also an opencollective.com page if you want to chip in. Uh, so yeah, just uh, to make it clear, most of the work done on the library is paid uh, work. It's not uh, hob hobbyist. So the library is thoroughly documented. There is an API doc. The links are uh, yeah, not very readable, but uh, uh, the API doc is uh, generated from the source, so it's pretty complete. It hasn't been very uh, readable since version 5 because of a restructuring, so we are aware of that, and it should be much better for version 6. Also on openlayers.org you'll find uh, almost a bit less than 200 examples. Uh, Basically, every feature of the library is showcased in, a, in an example. So, in my opinion, this is the best way to learn how to use it. So, if you go on an example page, you can uh, see all the code uh, uh, below the map, and you can also edit the example in CodePen. So, that's really useful. You can tweak it. So, the library is available on NPM as a package called OL, and it's published as ES6 modules. Um, this is important because uh, now, since version 5, um, even though the library is pretty big in terms of size, uh, when you import the different modules in your project, you will not end up with all the library in your application. So, uh, your application should not be too big because of open layers, unless you use 100% of the library. And uh, it's, uh, the library is written in JavaScript, but it has annotations type annotations, so you can use it uh, in your editor and you will have type checking, IntelliSense, uh, auto import, stuff like that. So you see here a quick video where I'm uh, attempting to write code. And uh, it works pretty well. So uh, to be honest, uh, setting up a project with this sort of uh, JavaScript project sometimes 
doesn't go as well as, as planned. So there is a lot of documentation on the GitHub of the project to tell you what exactly to do to have this sort of result. Um, the library has been built by almost 100 contributors over the year. Uh, you can see the graph of the commits here. So you see that we're still in a very active period. So it's a great time for the library. And we had more than 500 commits since the start of 2019. So it's really going strong. All right, so what about now? What's happening? Uh, so as I said, we're transitioning from version 5 to version 6. Version 5 was a big overhaul of the library. Uh, it was focused on uh, uh, developer experience. There was a, uh, we changed the system which, uh, w with which the library was built and shipped, which, was, which is called Closure Compiler. And we went to something more standard, which are ES6 modules. There are type checkings, more rendering tests. The result is that the library is easier to use, to include in your project, and it's also easier to contribute to uh, because there are more tests, it's safer. Now, in version 6, the focus was more on the library functionalities. Uh, there was a big focus on the vector tile performance, uh, which was there, has been there for a few versions, but we really wanted to step up on this topic. Also, better API, more possibilities, so a bit more flexibility, which is, uh, has always been a strong point of open layers. Also, there's going to be some work on the website and documentation. So, we had uh, two cut sprints since uh, the fall of 2018 for version 6. And uh, there is the last one that is planned at the end of September, and hopefully that will be the last step before the release. These code sprints have been funded by the community. There was a fundraising campaign, people responded to it. We could uh, fund a lot of uh, work time for this, so it's great. Thank you. Let's dive in on what's new in version 6. So there is a big thing that's happening. <laughs> um, Basically, uh, previously, when you had your open layers map in your page, you had uh, the equivalent of one image, and all the data, all the contents of the map was blended into this image. Now, with version 6, we're transitioning to what we call composite rendering, where each layer will have a different element on the page. Uh, standard layers will still use the canvas element, which is the, the basic thing when you want to draw stuff on a web page. You could, you could use something else. The idea is to give more flexibility and to open up options, possibilities. So it's not actually that new. Uh, and that's also why this talk is called, is called There and Back Again. Uh, besides being an obvious reference to Tolkien, it's also uh, because before that, open layers used to work pretty much like this. And then, so we. When do we, by doing this, we're kind of reassessing the choices that were made before, and we thought, okay, with uh, what's, what's happening now and what the browsers are capable now, let's go back to something more flexible like this. So we gain, uh, we make the library more versatile. The library code is a bit simpler because it doesn't have to compose all these things into one image, and it also leverages browser optimizations. So. It's pretty good. There were um, some uh, performance issues at the beginning. That was the biggest challenge, in my opinion. And you know, we made what was necessary to make it work. So now it's, it works great. And for those who know what it is, WebGL map is gone. But I'll, go, I'll get back to it uh, a bit later. OK, so about vector tile improvements. Um, this was supposed to be animated, but uh, it wasn't working well. Uh, so, on vector ties, uh, we really spend time optimizing and tweaking uh, the way they are generated and uh, rendered so that it gets smoother. Vector ties are pretty hard uh, to manage because they can be heavy and they're heavy on CPU, so it's hard to have a very smooth experience. But it got really better with this version. There's better tile queue management, uh, faster tile generation, and less tile loaded. The idea is to load only the ties we really need, and at the right time, not all the ties at the same time, etc. It's a bit hard to illustrate, it's a bit complex. 
I did put a small animation where you can see uh, the fact that we reuse ties across zoom levels. So this is, uh, this is captured using a, a slow internet connection. And you can see that the user experience is not too bad because you're still zooming in on one tile and gets rescaled up, but it, it's still sharp and that the details arrive gets better and better. So that's really something that we, that's something new in this version. Okay, um, let's talk a bit about WebGL. Um, Okay, so uh, you probably know that if you want to uh, display something in a web page, you have two choices. You either use 2D graphics or WebGL. 2D graphics is a very nice API, very easy to use. It gives uh, clean output. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's very nice, but it's slow. And WebGL is uh, all the contrary of this. It's a pretty uh, um, verbose API. It's hard to use. It has glitches and expected behaviors, so it's kind of a pain. Uh, originally in, version, in open years version 5 and, and before you had uh, two renderers available. You either had the default renderer which was using 2D graphics and then you had a WebGL renderer. You could create a map and say I want this map to use WebGL. It worked but it had uh, bugs, glitches, uh, the text were blurry and uh, the code was very complex because of this because uh, we basically had in the same project two libraries, one library to handle 2D graphics, another to do WebGL. It was a lot of code, very hard to maintain, and uh, not that used uh, eventually. So now that we have composite rendering, we said, hmm, why not just uh, render most of the map using 2D graphics because it looks good, it works well, and then for specific use cases, use WebGL. Uh, so we got rid of the monolithic renderer. We got, we just deleted it. It's still there in the history of the project, and we're still ins taking inspir inspiration from it. But it's really, it's gone from the library. And now we added some new, um, some new utilities to to the WebGL, and with a focus on being really lightweight and focused on specific use, specific use cases. So, the first use case we targeted was uh, large point data sets. You can see there's an example there. Uh, it's a map of the UFO sightings in the world. It's basically a population map. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, it's 80,000 points. And uh, with this uh, WebGL renderer, you can specify textures, you can specify colors, you can filter. You can have all sort of sorts of effects. It's pretty low level. Uh, it supports uh, retina devices, heat detection. It is multi-threaded, so it works. It runs pretty well. And you know, to make uh, to make a, to, to have a kind of proof of concept with this approach, we said, okay, why not rewrite the heat map layer? There was already a heat map layer in Open Airs. It worked pretty well. It was using uh, the 2D graphics API. Uh, with, we said, okay, uh, let's rewrite it with the power of WebGL. Now, when you look at a static image, the result was, will be exactly the same in version 5 and 6. But when you navigate in the map, then you'll see the difference. It's much smoother, uh, it's much uh, nicer experience. And uh, yeah, it works very well. So the, this is permitted because with this new renderer, we actually gave access to um, to shaders, which is uh, basically uh, uh, GPU programs. So for those of you who have attended uh, Ivan's workshop yesterday about WebGL raster processing, uh, this is something you can use what you learned in the in workshop with this renderer. This is exactly with the sort of power we wanted to give to the users. Okay, so now also we have, uh, with composite rendering, we can have custom layers. By custom layers, I mean layers that are not uh, the standard ones. Uh, any kind of HTML element. We said, okay, uh, we can put anything we want in the map, so why not try and put map box in the map? We were looking for a way to have a nice base map based on vector tiles, 
and uh, still be able to put stuff on it and uh, interactive layers, drawing, etc. Uh, using the vector tile layer of the library was uh, giving us a bit of a performance issue, especially on mobile devices. So we tried with Mapbox and actually it worked really well. So there is an example that showcases this. Um, so you see you have, a, you have the base map, which is my box, and then you have a, an overlay, which is a simple uh, country vector layer. Now, okay, so if any of you work at my box or are related one way or another to, to my box, to use this, we used uh, an undocumented API from the library, uh, which is a great library, by the way. <laughs> and. Uh, we would really like to have uh, some sort of official API to do this sort of integration because for us it's very interesting. It's really a way to have best of both worlds. So spread the word. <laughs> okay, you can do anything else you want. Actually, you can. Uh, uh, you could have uh, GIF animations, SVG objects in your map. You could have video, native HTML5 video elements. Um, these were the sort sort of things that. That were possible in previous versions, but because everything was kind of uh, blended into one image, uh, animations work weren't working well. You had to like copy the frames, and the frame rate wasn't good, and, every, and the SVG were blurred. So it was kind of um, hard to manage. With this new system, it should be much more easier. Now this is not yet implemented, and we'd like to have this in, but that's uh, that's a lot of work. So if anyone wants to try and contribute, be my guest. And on the illustration, you can see there is a, a graticule layer which was rewritten and uh, reworked for the composite rendering. So it's just an example among others to use this system. We also reworked a bit uh, the way the view constraints work. Um, you, you will be able now to uh, specify an extent constraint are you on, your, uh, on your map which means the user will not be able to zoom out or pan out of this extent. It wasn't really possible before. You could specify a center constraint or a zoom constraint, but this is a combination of both. And using this system, we implemented what I call multi-word constraint. Uh, you see on the left, this was something that was quite frequent with open layers because you could zoom out to uh, zoom level zero, and then you'd see all these mirrors of the word and doesn't really make sense. Um, now, the default behavior is that you are not able to do this, and uh, you, you will kind of uh, be limited by the height of the word. Uh, so it's better user experience. It's less misleading. You, s you can still have the previous behavior if you want with an option. There's also multi-threading that was added to open layers. This was a um, very, very nice contribution. There is a pipeline that's completely seamless for uh, the application. The users, you absolutely don't have to worry about it. It's just there. It's only used in the WebGL renderer for now, but it would be very interesting to use it uh, for uh, all the CPU heavy tasks like data processing and also vector type generation, which can be pretty hard. Um, all right, so I covered um, most aspects of the version 6. So there are some things planned for the future. Uh, there is something uh, as a work in progress, which would be a big change in the API. So for those of you who, are, who have actually um, used uh, uh, written code with open layers, the API, uh, uh, for example, if your map is rendered in Web Mercator, which is most likely the case, you will need to give the API coordinates in Web Mercator. And this is not really uh, practical, so you end up transforming geographic coordinates to Web Mercator all the time. It is uh, error prone, it's annoying, it's verbose. So the idea would be to transition the API to uh, only use geographic coordinates all the time um, and not take in to consideration the view projection. This is a work in progress. I'm, I don't know if it's going to be there in version 6 or not. Uh, at some point, we'll have to stop adding new stuff. <laughs> but um, I can talk for the others. <laughs> also, uh, the uh, improvements to data structures we'd like to have in. Currently, all the features, geometries, styles are uh, based on classes. So. Yeah, it's nice, but it's uh, take a bit of memory. It's not serializable, 
and it cannot be used in multi-trading uh, uh, context. So we'd like to move to something more based on JSON, GeoJSON, to have uh, more uh, uh, useful use cases. And that would mean uh, rewriting the whole API, so probably for uh, another major version. So what's next? More multi-trading, more RevGL possibilities, um, lines, polygons, of course, that would be great. And new and emerging formats when they arrive. That's it. Any questions? Okay, the question is how hard, how hard will it be to migrate from version 5 to version 6? Um, it shouldn't be too, too hard. Most of the changes are under the hood, so you won't see the difference in your code. Um, I think it should, be, it should be easy. Yeah, and it's all documented. The breaking changes are documented. Okay, so um, okay, that's a good question. Uh, Open Airs is not able to uh, use Mapbox styles directly. There is a library that is part of the organization on GitHub that does this. It's called OL Mapbox style, and it takes a JSON uh, Mapbox JSON and transforms it into Open Layer styles. Um, okay, you should, um, if you want to use different renderers, basically you won't uh, create the renderer yourself. This is kind of internal stuff. The API is not completely final on this, we need to, wor to work this out. But you'll probably just create a layer, and it's going to be either a layer, like vector layer, which is standard, or you maybe have like a points, uh, points layer, which will use the WebGL renderer. But it's, it's all under the hood, and we, we want to make the API very simple. Uh, you know. I'm asking this because right now you cannot play SVG with open so oh, um. how would this be possible to implement in SVG ties? Uh, you probably have to write something <laughs> SVG render. I don't know, it's a good question. Um, it would be interesting to have a specific renderer for this, for example, that uses SVG element. Mm -hmm. But that would be that that's not there. That's not there already. Um, we have an uh, Android 6 application with uh, OpenLayer 5, and uh, we were having some, some issues with the production build because it was facing in the minification uh, step of the, of the production build. Is that something that um, there have been improvements. I cannot guarantee that it's going to be fixed. It all depends on how you include the library. Uh, it's true that for a while it wasn't very clear how you were supposed to include it. Um, you can have this sort of stuff working perfectly. Uh, we have many projects with uh, OpenAir 6. It works great. It's just a matter of configuration. So it's re there's a lot of documentation on this topic. And we know it's hard for people. Uh, the library is published as uh, ES6. Uh, so uh, you have to take that into account. But you know it should be in the documentation. Uh, that, was, that was tricky. <laughs> uh, so the, the web workers are uh, separate files in the source code. And uh, when there are, there is a transpiling step before publishing the package. And at that time, the, the, the worker code is written as a blob in the, in the package. 
uh, it's all uh, it's a great system <laughs> it's awesome okay okay thank you very much <laughs>